Hi, I'm Katie and this is episode 82 of Ornamentations and I have a great one for you today because I have a whopping four finishes. I'm so proud of myself. Also have some hauls, some really exciting news, and then we're going to end today with a show and tell of my personal mother of pearl needlework collection. It's beautiful and I'm going to really enjoy sharing it with you, but we'll start today with some news items. So first of all, Thomas the Sparkle Prim Turkey by Not Forgotten Farm is completely sold out. Thank you so much. It's now full steam ahead to holiday getting, which I'm very excited about. And then I also have a short tutorial up for you if you haven't seen it already, and that's on blocking your cross stitch pieces. I did have a longer, more intensive one up as part of the Simple Harmony series, but this is just a uh, quick and dirty to get you through smaller cross stitch finishes. I hope you find it helpful. But the really big news in my world is from the attic. The announcement for registration for Sampler Symposium 2025 is now up on their website. The registration date is Monday, October 21st at 8 a.m. Phoenix time, and the registration email is different this time. Check the newsletter, which is on the attic's website and, and linked in this description for full details. I will be there. I am teaching myself, but for me at least, the real news is that Rebecca Scott of Whitney Antiques is coming and giving what is going to be an absolute banger of a talk. I'm just so excited about this. I hope you are too because her topic is incredible. She is going to be speaking on Betty Ring, who she knew personally. Cool fact, who knew that? I didn't know that. And if I think probably most of you watching know who Betty Ring is and can just skip forward a couple minutes. But if you don't, the TLDR on Betty Ring is that she literally wrote the book, or rather books, because it's a two volume set on American samplers. And more than that, she basically invented the field of sampler research as we know it today. Genealogical research on girls who stitch samplers, groupings of styles and regions, looking into teachers and schools where these pieces were taught and sewn, all the work of Betty Ring. She was a true pioneer. We're all standing on her shoulders. She was also a noted collector as well as a scholar. Sotheby's auctioned her collection back in 2012 and it brought in a whopping four million dollars. If you want to see what four million dollars worth of samplers looks like, I'll link that in the description too. It's worth checking out. She had some wonderful things, but her books are also wonderful. The set Girlhood Embroidery is long out of print. You can find it usually reasonably expensive, but it's the definitive resource on all things American samplers by an absolute titan in the field. So Betty Ring is an amazing topic and I cannot wait to see what Rebecca Scott has to say about her. It's big news that she's coming, but then such a fabulous topic. It's just <laughs> the best part of being faculty this year is that I don't have to worry about registration. I know I get to go, so I'm really thrilled. And then I'll also be there as well. Um, I'm very honored to be part of what Jean is calling the Attic All-Star Lineup. 2025 is going to be a big year for her because it marks 20 years of events at the Attic. I think it's the 20th anniversary of Sampler Symposium, actually, and so I don't really think I'm an all-star, but I'm really happy to be included and most of all to get to go because I think it's going to be really exciting. So if any of that sounds of interest to you and you think you might be able to come join us, registration Monday, October 21st, full details in the description. I hope to see you there because oh, I'm really excited to be going. But with that, let's get to my own stitching and we're going to start with my finishes. I've got four of them. I hardly know where to start, but we'll start with the longest running one, which was Plum Street Samplers Flag Thief. I didn't just finish the grass. I finished the whole thing. I think my favorite 
finished here might be a little controversial. Even my mom was like, no, Katie, that's, that's wrong. You shouldn't have done that. But take a look. Tell me what you think. One, the colors are spectacular, but I did leave off the flag. And before you rip my head off, let me explain. So I had originally left space in the roof to stitch the flag, but as this was coming together, the design nerd in me just took over. This was such a strong and beautifully balanced composition with the house flanked by the trees, anchored by the grass, that I couldn't throw it off center with the flag. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mom. And she goes, no, you have to stitch the flag. I said, I'm not stitching the flag, Mom. And she goes, no, but you have to stitch the flag. I said, Mom, I already filled in the roof. Too late. I'm not stitching the flag. And she said, well, I think you should just just take that out and stitch flag. I'm like, too bad. Design went out here, or rather, not design. It's not like the American flag is poor design. Composition and balance went out. However, I would notice that note that the kit is going to include everything you need to stitch this exactly as charted, so that you can put in the flag as well as all the other details around the house. I actually left most of those out as well because I felt like there was just so much going on here and I wanted it to be a little simpler around it. So I did three stars and one of the dark blues. And if you're interested in following what I did, all of that is chronicled and detailed in the conversion. This will be the 2025 Floss 2 kit. And then I also added some star sequins because you know me, I couldn't resist. I just had to. And those will be included in the kit as well. You can use them. You can not use them. You can put them away for a future project, whatever you want. I think a lot of you are going to stitch flag thief exactly as charted. And I think that those versions are going to look beautiful, but you know me, I just can't help myself. I have to tweak things. So flag thief, which I am just so pleased with. It has been blocked. So that's why it's all neat, flat, squared out. And then I am going to send it off for framing. I did want to note one other thing here. So the final conversion is 12 threads. I've got some reds, green, and then, oh, the fox. So I used a very gold color for the fox. One, because that's just how I like my oranges with much more yellow than red. It does actually show up reasonably orange when it's flanked by all the grass, but also because doing that meant that it could pull double duty and it can also be used for the beak and feet on the eagles. So you don't need two colors. You've just got the one so you can stitch that as charted does double duty got our greens white and then take a look at the other side brown and blues so this is kind of an interesting lineup of blues because they're not all in the same tonal family however when you look at the roof they're mostly middle to dark value colors with the exception of that lightest blue and so when i did blues from the same tonal family or like a slate gray they were all just blending into each other and you couldn't make out all the detail in the roof which is one of the great things about this pattern in my opinion so switching to blues with very different tonal structures that's blue but it's actually got a lot of green in it more purple woad and then kind of like a sky blue here with just a little bit of gray in it that meant that those were all distinct colors and you could really see the detail in the roof without it disappearing on you so i did have that was a little interesting as a color conundrum but i could see where my problem was coming from so it wasn't that hard to fix so that is like the finally and i'm so, so pleased with it. I could not be more, oh, doesn't that look amazing? It looks amazing. The colors are so strong on this. It's just such a beautiful design. So I'm sending this off for framing. I'll show it to you when I get it back and then it will be the summer floss tube kit for next year. I hope you're looking forward to stitching it because I had a great time with it. 
at some point after I get AKGIT back from framing, I'd like to do an episode centered around what some of my favorite cross stitches, cross stitch pieces have been to stitch. Not just my favorite finishes, but what did I enjoy the actual stitching on the most? I can tell you right now, AKGIT actually heads that list by a lot. There are some other great things. So I'm gonna have a think on that. And then when I get that back from framing, we'll do an episode around that. And then next finish. What we saw on the blocking tutorial, Stacy Nash Primitives, Jack's House and Keep. This is the six colors as were shared in the previous episode. I will put them again in this episode's description. And then this is my finish. Don't you love it? I love it. It's perfect. I'm not really a false stitcher, as I noted last time, but every once in a while a chart comes around that speaks to me and this is it. And yes, the bottom's skewed. You can put lots of effort into your blocking and get everything all perfect. But if your cutting is lazy, then you end up with a skewed bottom to your pillow. However, it's going to sit in a tray and I decided I could just live with that. I was over it at that point. I can be very, very lazy with my finishing. I am great about blocking my finishes, but I, when it comes to the actual stitching, turning, and stuffing, I'm mm, not that virtuous, but yeah. It's gonna look great with my other fall finishes. I love it. I did just a silk satin backing. And as I mentioned last time, I did this on Himalayan Fog, 38 count, but I think Smoke Signal would really be perfect though cream of the house would pop even more than it does on the Himalayan fog. I think tonally that would look fabulous, although I am very pleased with it. And then I do also have a finish on my recommended smoke signal. Look at me, I'm just plowing through finishes. Who am I? I don't even know. And that was my October 12 by 12. So this is a start and a finish. I both started and finished this since I saw you last, which is not surprising because it's tiny. And that's not Forgotten Farm Chimney Suit Santa. So I can't recommend this highly enough either with my conversion or with the called for if you would like a quick and enjoyable holiday stitch. This would be perfect for a gift, for an exchange, because it works up so quickly. There's really nothing to it, but it's so, so cute. So I gave it a hanger of the metallic soft twist cord. I love this color. It's like gold and black together, so it's kind of indeterminate, but festive goes with everything. It's from Access Commodities. You can get it from an AL and S. I'll put the link in the description. And then I just did a silk satin backing. But let's talk about the details here. So this is an original silk conversion, although one of these threads is not silk. It's my much beloved Bijou, which never shows up well on camera, honestly. So Bijou is a metallic filament wrapped around a black cord. Oh, okay. That's what it looks like when it's stitched. But when I hold the stitched piece up, you don't really see that. It's the black that comes to the fore and not the glow. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Okay, that's what the looks black part of this looks like and then these are my threads i will put all the description all the details in the description so he's got a metallic chimney piece that he's standing on and then i just gave him some tiny sequins anchored by beads for snowballs oh i did leave out his pipe I felt like he could just be hanging out with this, I don't know, mistletoe branch or whatever. And then I accented this with two millimeter crystal rounds color cyan. Those are discontinued. They're impossible to find. If you have some, lucky you, they're fabulous. However, I do have a substitution if you'd like to accent this with beads instead of the called for thread. And that would be Miyuki 150 
1420 is the color number and it's silver lined brick red. I use this a lot for holiday finishes when I can't bring myself to use some of my carefully hoarded red crystal rounds, but it's a good substitute and oh, oh, isn't he fun? So that's my October 12 by 12. I'm on target to have 12 new ornaments for my tree by the end of the year and November is going to be here before I know it. I do have one more October floss tube. So next time I will think about what my November 12 by 12 is going to be and then we will take a look at what I've picked for that. And then my, oh no, before I went on, I was going to talk a couple color points about this. So Chimneys to Santa. If you are using this conversion, please do so with my blessing, but I'm going to give you some homework and that's to look at a couple of things here very closely and make your own decisions about whether or not you want to follow each of these choices. So when I was stitching this, I was really torn between how I liked the more muted kind of prim model and then the linen smoke signal that I chose for it. And that kind of seemed to echo that. And then what I was torn between was all of that and my own very strong inclination towards sparkle prim as typified by the choice of Bijou and crystals and sequins to go with this. So my inclination towards sparkle prim led me to choose the Bijou, but that set off a whole chain reaction of consequences because this is much darker because of the black core than the middle value kind of aged, toned down, warm, pinky red brick that's seen on the chimney piece in the model. So giving this a much darker bottom also highlights the contrast with the white in the chimney, although that was also something I changed. The called for is more of like a light gray. I wanted to use creme here just because you've also got it in the beard, you're stitching with silk, why not repeat colors? So that gives a lot of contrast here and kind of drags the eye downwards. So first question is, are you going to use the bijou, yes, no, or are you drawn more towards the muted tones of the original? Second question, do you want to use creme or a similar white or off-white here, or do you want to replace the light gray? And then the other consequent of the darker red altering the color balance here is that the this, the model is pretty much all metal value. So it's, I'm trying to think how to say this. It's easier to achieve harmony there because you've just got a string of colors kind of in the same value range. And when I say middle value, another term for this is saturation. But what it basically means is in between the spectrum of dark and light, so at one end being white and at the other end being true black, where are you between those, between light and dark? Middle value is kind of that indeterminate range that covers a lot of colors. So you can have a blue, a red, and a gray that are all middle value tones because they're different colors, but they're about the same distance between light and dark on that spectrum. I hope that explanation made sense. It's really hard to explain color terms. Well, anyways, what was I going to say? So putting that very dark red in there shifts. You don't now have all middle value tones. And so I had to balance that out. And so I used a slightly, well, you know, it's so funny. I hold this up to the camera and that looks really similar to the model, but 
I was thinking that I needed to use a brighter green than the more toned down one I had originally picked out for this because it needed some balance against the dark here. So another question for you, question number three. Oh, I'm talking in circles here. I'm sorry. Is do you agree with the choice on the green? Of course, I think I'm skewing the question here, holding that up <laughs> right next to the photo of the model looks just like it. But do you think the chosen green for the Santa, not the lighter one here, provides enough balance to the very dark bottom? So those are some very specific color questions to think about if you're using this to decide your own answers for. Or you can just say, you know, I like what you did, Katie, and I'm just going to copy that. However, if you are trying to work towards a greater understanding of color, I know some of you are, those are some, I thought, teeing up questions and telling you what the things to think about in picking your own on this one very limited choice palette or might be a useful thought exercise. If you found that helpful at all, please do let me know because I don't know, maybe that was terrible and just a long and boring diversion on my gloss tube that you would never like me to repeat. But many people have told me that they do like the color discussion. So I was trying to think what would be a good learning question. And I hope that that was in some way helpful. I'm not sure if that made any sense at all. However, we are going to move now to my last finish, which is not cross stitch. And that is another one of my crystal doves, but this one is facing in the opposite direction from my model. I've been asked several times, can you stitch the dove in the opposite direction from the model, which is going this way? The answer is absolutely quite emphatically yes. You just flip the pattern pieces over and essentially mirror the instructions. It's very, very easy. So I did a dove in the opposite direction. This is for something quite special that I will be showing you in the holiday kickoff episode, which is going to be on November 12th when the holiday kits release. That's going to be the fabulous crystal dove. It is honestly even sparklier in person. It's showing up reasonably well on this video. The lights got in here today for that. And then the Prairie Schooler Santa kit. However, we are going to do a mini preview uh, next episode, which will be leading up to the holiday releases. And I'm preparing something very special for the holiday releases. So that's why I did yet another dove. I now have five in my personal collection. But honestly, I enjoy making these so much. Once you get into it, it's just all I want to do. Honestly, I'd be really content if I just had nothing going on but a dove assembly line between here and December. The year I first developed these and starting make, started making them, I think I just did nothing but make doves. I gave them to everyone I know. My hairdresser has two doves. I'm not kidding. I mean, I just couldn't stop making them and I didn't want my own tree to be nothing but doves. So I just was handing them out to everyone I met. It's like, oh, if I met you too, I know your name. Have a dove. They're addictive. You've been warned. But with that, those are my four finishes. Can you see my happy shining face? I'm just in a really, really good mood. It's finally fall and it's hockey season and I love hockey season and I love fall and I love sweater weather. We're getting close to holiday stitching, which is my theme music. So it's just happiness all around here. And with that, I'm going to put a few things away and then show you my whips. Okay, whips, or rather one whip. I was so busy with all my finishes. Can you tell how proud I am? It's kind of silly, but I was so busy with my finishes that I did not work on my two sampler whips, which are Elizabeth Campbell by Fox and Rabbit and Eliza Townsend by Cross Stitch Antiques. I do hope to get back to those soon now that I've cleared some of my other projects, but I also do want to have some smalls going regularly just because they're fun. And also I think 
Plus, tube's really boring because I'm just showing you the same two samplers all the time. So I would like to have a new start for next time. And the two charts I'm looking at are the Stacey Nash Animal Crackers series, Bobbin. As you might have heard, Mouse was my beloved little brother's childhood nickname. And so my mom and I are super suckers for cute little stitched mice. Although not actual things, so nice. So I'm gonna change that tail to be gray. The pink is a little overly realistic for me. I don't like the real thing. I mean, like I scream bloody murder when I was when I encounter one because I was traumatized as a girl. So. <laughs> When I was a teenager, we were cleaning out the garage and my dad handed me my rollerblades. Yes, I've just dated myself spectacularly. That's fine. And for some reason, I thought it was a good idea to stick my hand into my rollerblades. I felt something soft. I assumed I had left a sock in there. So I grabbed it, I pulled it out, and it was a dead mouth and I just started screaming and my mom was next to me and she started screaming and my dad came running and my mom and I were just screaming, 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 screaming and he just, what's wrong with the two of you? And that's what we're like when we're confronted with actual mice which makes the extreme love for stitched mice kind of ironic, but I never said I was consistent, whatever. And then the other one, story time, is Pineberry Lane, a token of love. I just think this is great. It'd be really fun to stitch. You can get some great colors in here and it's, I don't think it's huge. It's, uh, hold on. Oh, the Stitch counts on the front, stitch counts on the front. 153 by 98, it's not particularly dense. I think that would be a great small. So I'm going to start at least one of these before I see you next, maybe both, I don't know, we might get crazy. But the whip that has been getting my attention, other than my finishes, look at me, I've been so productive, is on my casket. I have some great progress to show you on my in progress left side panel. The panel itself is almost done. I'm gonna have to decide on how to design the freeze very, very soon. So, we now have the second flower in with its needleless petals, as well as the gold work cartouche, and then what remains on the panel itself. I say I haven't done anything on the freeze, I haven't even designed the freeze, is to add some needleless petals to the, I don't know, whatever this flower is, carnation, maybe, I don't know. being botanically accurate, it's not a thing when it comes to stump or converter for me, I just stitch pretty flowers that I like. Anyways, so, oh, does that look great or what? I am going to put a photo in here because there's something about the light in here in the video that makes the greens in particular not show up true tone. So, Take a look now because the gilt silk twist is not nearly as dark as it looks in the video and it shows much better in still photography. So I think this gives you a much better idea of what the colors actually look like. That shading is not nearly as harsh as it's showing on camera. It's a little weird. Anyways, so the panel as it stands right now is an object lesson in letting materials do the work for you because there wasn't that much stitching in this. This uses primarily two stitches, which is long and short stitch and couching. There's also a little needle lace, some satin stitch, and some French knots because I can't ever just do one thing. I have to do all the things. But it's quite flat. It's quite easy to stitch up. And a lot of the texture that you're seeing is the result of using really interesting threads. So I got a whole lot of effect with very little efforts. And that's because of my choice of threads and how they're deployed here. 
and that's most evident in the cartouche. So those of you who do gold work know of a technique called essing that looks a fair amount like this in its actual result, although it's not quite that perfectly round. Now, if I had done essing for the cartouche, I would have had to pad that out, cut out a zillion identically sized tiny pieces of pearl in smooth and check textures, and then painstakingly stitch them all down. Yeah, I didn't do any of that. I just took this fabulous, fabulous thread. It's from Thistle Threads. I think it's totally sold out, so now I'm just being a gigantic tease. And then I couched it down. I also used pearl gimp inside it, so I've got two threads there. I couched two threads down and the entire cartouche took me less than an hour, but it looks fabulous. I love it when I get to cheat. Get really amazing looks with, oh, yeah, zero effort. It's maybe not quite as oval as it should be. I'm going to have to check my drawing next time, make sure it's better. I've also used gilt pearl gimp, just we're going to name some threads here, which is right there. Um, satin gimp, which is the thicker stem on both flowers. Double twist gimp, which has been couched down here, the ground. And silk wrapped gimp, which is the return inside the buttonhole stitch on the needle lace on this ground as well as the gold threads in the cartouche to get all of these cool textures with very, very little work. Couching is not hard at all, but you get all these awesome textures that look like they should be hard. Awesome. I love it. So, ooh, ooh, we're close. I might have a finish on the panel panel, minus the phrase, which I really have to do. And the next time I see you, because I just have to do some needle lace petals and put them in. Looks good. And I do have to make a decision about the design of the freeze. So on the green casket, which is behind me, which we looked at in a long ago episode, I'll put which one in the description. I did all the panels and then I left the freezes until the very end because I wasn't sure what they should look like. I thought, you know, I'll do everything else. I'll put it on the casket and then I'll know what it needs and I'll do that. So I stitched the whole casket. I did the interior. I did all the finishing. I had everything except the freezes. I sat there. I looked at it and no answer came to me. It was a whole lot of what now? And it spent ages and time out being this close to finished. So I learned my lesson, which is not to do that again. I, ever since then, have decided to stitch freezes concurrently with their panels. So I have to make the design decision on what happens next on this casket. I think that might take me a hot minute. I've got two ideas and I can't quite choose between them. I do also have another big whip that many of you have been quite interested in, and that's the beaded basket. I did actually do a little work on that since I saw you last, but we'll check in with that next time because I was struggling with how to finish off what I was working on, which was a set of flowers. So I did do some work, but mostly I sat there, stared at it, frowned, thought, stared at it, frowned, thought. Finally came to a decision, but I don't have much to actually show you, so we'll check in with that next time. Another question that has frequently come up with regards to that. I'm really sorry, I don't actually have resources to recommend to you on how do you do this, because I taught myself by experimenting. I did look for books 10 years ago, so great resources may have been published in the interim. I just don't know about them. And I taught myself by experimenting. Did I say that? I mean, I said that already. So what's being used on the pieces you've seen so far is a technique called peyote stitch. And that's 
pretty much the foundational bead weaving technique. It's very easy, but the beads are extraordinarily small, much smaller than anything made today. And that's what allows for all the detail that you're seeing in those pieces. So peyote stitch, P-E-Y-O-T-E. -E. And there are probably a lot of tutorials here on YouTube if you look them up. There are books as well, but I don't have a definitive resource to point you towards if you're interested in it. The work is really fun and very engrossing, so if you're interested, I would encourage you to go ahead and dive into that. I just don't have a helpful reference to point you towards me. I'm sorry about that. And then haul. I do have just a little bit of haul, but it's a pretty fabulous haul. So this is one of two. The other is with my mom because she helps me so much on my kids and she never wants anything for it. So I try to think of little gifts of things that she will like as a thank you for all that she does for me. So I pre-ordered two tomato bags from Stitch Folk. The little tomato fob here is just something that I added. It didn't come with it. And they came. My mom already has hers. And then this, this is mine. It's currently project homeless so i have to think of something to put in here and we'll see what gets in my tomato bag next time but that brings me to the last thing i have for today which is some fabulous show and tell so i am fortunate enough to have a lot of a different mother of pearl needlework treasures from Jackie Duplessis. As of now, she doesn't have a web so shop, so if you'd like to order anything that you've seen here, you need to reach out to her directly, Facebook, Instagram, or through her website, which I will link in the description. But whether or not you want to have anything of your own, I thought it might be really fun to look at the different treasures I have collected in the years I have known. Jackie, who is also a dear friend. So we'll start with one of the most spectacular, and which I have already shown on this channel when I got it. I just had to show it. I mean, it, does it really hurt to look at it again? And also, I think you do see some of the true rainbow iridescence as a mother of pearl with the light in here. So this is Basket. And this and a few of my other pieces normally sit in a tray with my little berry bowl and some other treasures on my desk. I'm putting a photo in here to show you how I usually display these pieces. I do actually like to have them out and look at them. And this is one of my favorite things that I keep out all the time. I also have two pen keeps from Jackie. The first is the tasseled leaf. I have shown this before as well and this normally sits in my mother of pearl basket because I can't bring myself to put this one away. It's just so fabulous. And then I have also shown you the tulip. I really do have to remake this because I changed out the provided uh, ribbon and silk to do this and I think I kind of botched the finishing. But you can see how detailed and exquisite the mother of pearl is with those fabulous cutouts and oh i just love it yes i do actually have to remake this and really do justice to jackie's work which i kind of butchered with my crappy finishing but don't hold that against her that's my fault i also have a thread palette this was one of our gifts from jean at summer school this year so it's engraved with the attic on it or samplers rule and, ooh, oh, I almost forgot, also really fabulous. I have a set of three spool holders. So I put one on just a brown goblins that I use a lot because I cracked the top off and so then you can hold it on with the <laughs> spool holder. One of the few actual practical uses I found for it. It's this beautiful dimensional flower. I don't know how well that's showing up. And then the other two are on very special greens that I use a lot in my casket stitching, a go blends and a gilt twist. 
So it, just because these are two of my favorite threads, I put my mother of pearl spool holders on here because they're out all the time. I get to look at them and then they complement some of my favorite threads. But they can also hold on your spool tops if you crack them off, which is something I actually manage to do pretty regularly because I'm absurdly clumsy. That's a thing. And then the last thing I have are my little collection of thread winders. So I actually need some more because I am doing something special with this. And oh, I absolutely pre-ordered the spectacular Leaf in a Bird thread winder that Jackie shared recently on Instagram. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out. I She had the prototype for that at summer school and I just zeroed right in and was like, what is this? that and when can I get one because I have to have one. But anyways, my thread winders. So this collection is going to grow because I'm doing something with them, but I'm going to show you what I do have. So this one has, oh, it's not really showing. It has beautiful engraving on it. Very detailed because this one doesn't have as much cutout work as you often see with Jackie's work. I have a couple of rectangular ones. This one is Cupid's Arrows. And then this one is very, very special to me. It's a sailing ship. And this was a personal gift from Jackie the first time I met her, which was some years ago. We were both teaching at the same event and we immediately bonded over Mother of Pearl. I had asked her to show me what she had with her. She showed me her stitched pieces, but also her Mother of Pearl, which she was getting more into at the time. And I said, oh, I have some antique Mother of Pearl. So I don't have the Palais Royale needlework tools, but I do have some antique Mother of Pearl gambling chips. I don't use them as gambling chips, but I sometimes use them as thread winders just because really pretty to look at and Jackie went oh my gosh so do I and we ended up talking for I think an hour and a half about mother of pearl and she gave me this as a gift to uh, I guess remember and honor our instant connection we were kindred spirits from the start if you've never had the pleasure of meeting Jackie she's legitimately the nicest person you will ever meet. And I also just love this one because of the ship. I was born on an island, so I love the ocean. And my American grandfather served in the Navy during World War II, he was a sailor. Reportedly, he used to sing me dirty sea shanties as lullabies when I was a very young child. So it's all his fault that I occasionally turn the air blue. And then I also have two beautiful rounds with exquisite cutouts. So one I've left on its hanger because I broke this recently and I have to be very careful with it. I'm such a klutz. These are actually reasonably deaf, but I managed to drop this from like a solid 10 feet and one of the little bits broke. I was able to put it back together very carefully with glue. I don't think you can really tell that I busted this up, but I'm trying to be very careful with my treasure since I was horribly careless and I feel very bad about that. I shouldn't be allowed to have nice things. And then this I showed you last time. This was one of the ones Susan Stanley had. I'm super bummed I missed out on the other thread winder, but hope springs eternal. Maybe next time. So those are my mother of pearl treasures from Jackie. As I said last time, I'm not really a collector by nature, except for <laughs> books, thread, and beads, which are, yeah, those are collections, but just things that I set out and look at are more unusual for me. These, I don't know what it is. It's, 
detail. It's the rainbow luminescence of the material. I do love natural materials, all the wonders you can find in nature, the wonderful grain patterns you can find in wood and stone, the beauty of glass. And so yeah, in that sense, I guess it makes sense that um, Mother of Pearl appeals to me a lot. But Jackie just does so much of this. I'm always so excited to see what her creative brain has come up with now. So we text a fair amount about her latest adventures in Mother of Pearl. And I'm always just drooling over the things she comes up with. So I hope you enjoyed the mini tour of my Mother of Pearl collection. I have a few more things on order. We'll take a look at that when they come in. Oops, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> what I'm doing with this is going to be truly awesome, let me tell you. But I've been talking long enough, so I'm going to bring this episode to a close. For next time, we're going to have whips, cross-stitch, beaded, and otherwise. Hopefully some starts, one start, two starts, three starts, 10 starts, who knows? I just had four finishes, so I feel like I can do whatever I want. We are going to check in on the beaded basket. I hope to have some great progress to show you next time. And then we're also going to have a brief preview of the holiday kits, which are coming very soon. Still a lot of kidding for me to do. So I've got my work cut out for me over the next month. And then I also have a little giveaway for you that'll be really fun and looking forward to holiday stitching, which is always my favorite time of the year. I love fall. I love the changing of leaves and of the weather, the cooler temperatures, sweaters, most of all, hockey season. The Sharks haven't managed to win a game yet, but hope springs eternal. And it's a beautiful time of year. I hope that it's a beautiful time of year where you are. If you were affected by the terrible hurricanes, I hope that you're recovering from that. That's been awful to see. And I just hope that you are having a beautiful fall wherever you are, that you're having some great, great stitching and that you will tune back in again in two weeks. I'll see you next time. And until then, happy stitching.